Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jonathan Fisher. Are you still blaming price for lost sales? In a recent survey, it was found that salespeople blamed 74% of their lost deals on a lower cost competitor, while customers listed price as the key reason for their buying decision only 22% of the time. So why are sales professionals getting this wrong and what can you do to overcome this? Well, today's guest has the answers for us. He's a specialist in the sales process. His name is Steve Gilda. He is a sales process expert. And along with his partner, Kevin Jones, he's the co-founder of Ignite Selling, an innovative consulting, sales enablement, and performance improvement company dedicated to helping companies of all types exceed their revenue goals by implementing simulation-based learning solutions. Today, Steve will go in-depth and share proven strategies that will help your sales team manage key influencers, stop blaming price, and accelerate your sales pipelines fast. Steve, welcome to the Evolve Sales Leader. Great to have you. Jonathan, it's great to be with you and as well as all your listeners. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. So uh, just looking at what your firm does to help companies grow, uh, it, it seems like we're fellow travelers to a certain extent. We love you know, getting the, the latest and greatest cutting edge methodologies and helping train people on those. Tell us a little bit more about your background. How'd you get into doing what the work you do at Ignite Selling? You know, like uh, many people I, in, in this industry, start off in sales. And uh, I worked for a company called Lanier Worldwide at the time. And I started my career, actually it was 3M Corporation, selling copiers. And I spent 10 years with that company, later became Harris 3M, later became Lanier after that. And I, as I made my way from a sales rep to a district manager to a regional vice president, I was then kind of introduced into, I had an opportunity to kind of come into this industry by a gentleman gentleman by the name of Neil Rackham. Neil Rackham, many of your listeners may be aware of, wrote a book called Spin Selling, as well as several other books. And that was my first entree into this performance consulting space. That was back in the mid-1990s. Stuck with Neil for a number of years until he ended up selling the business. And after he sold the business, kind of provided me an opportunity if I wanted to stick with the new owners, go off on my own. And in 2002, I started my own company in the performance consulting space. Well, I got to say, having Neil Rackham say, hey, I'm going to build a business around you. It seems like pretty good credentials. So it's great to have you to share your insights with us today. So uh, the, the the topic of the day is how price stands in the way. And yeah, I mean, anyone that's been around sales for five minutes knows, especially B2B, you know, they want to have you know requ requests for multiple proposals. You're being stacked up against at least two other competitors. And a lot of times it is the bean counters seem like it seems like they have a lot of control over the decision. Maybe you can kind of walk us through, talk about some of the factors behind price. What role does it really play? Set the table for us a bit, if you would, Steve. Sure. I think that in order to really kind of break it down, we all have to acknowledge that price will always be a critical criteria of, of any kind of buying decision, whether it's something we're buying personally, like a home or a car, uh, to some of what our competitors are, are, are uh, some of our customers are actually going through. Price will always be somewhat of a factor. But I think we have to acknowledge, first of all, that there are several key influencers involved. Yes, that bean counter, to your point, Jonathan, will always have some kind of a say. But there are often other people involved. And in this more complex, in the more complex sale that some of your listeners may be participating in, there are often several key influencers involved, sometimes even a committee. And it's important for us to kind of understand. Who really does have the higher level of importance? If we had to rank those top three, four, five people, do we understand who has the highest level of influence in this decision as opposed to the lowest level of influence? And then from there, we can begin to explore what's the criteria that matters most to those individuals? And it's when we begin to kind of understand the criteria that matters most to those individuals and maybe how does the decision criteria between the top two key influencers differ we begin to really get an, a clearer picture to which we can begin to lay down a sales strategy. So do you think salespeople frequently take this, the, the price objection more seriously than they should? Is that, is that part of the deal as well? And on the other side of the table, is that sometimes thrown out there by only one of the shareholders when in reality, there's a lot more of the conversation to be had. So maybe that is that is that sort of its own sale that needs to be made? I, th I think so. I think um, 
it's it's first of all, I think it's really important for us to really understand that um, there often are many decision criteria, many decision criteria that that kind of comes down to. It's not going to be just price, as I said earlier, but to your point, it's going to be really important that we kind of understand that. Um, yes, salespeople will often put more credibility to this price objection that actually exists. If you if you find yourself in that position or you find one of your teammates in that position, simply ask the question, other than price, what are the other two or three criteria this customer is using to compare you against the competition? Because in absence of knowing that other criteria, we're always going to think that price is the most important criteria. So it's important for us to begin to explore what are those other critical criteria other than price. And our research shows that in most cases, salespeople can't answer that second question. What other than what criteria other than price is this customer using to compare you to the competition? Hmm. And thus, we end up putting more more credence into into price than necessary. Yeah, right. And I should point out to the listener that the study I alluded to in the intro was a study that was conducted by Ignite Selling. Um, and there's actually a case study you can download from their website if you like. So, Steve, to that point, you you dug deep with your own clients and asked them this question. What were some of the thing, lessons you learned in terms of what what really were the criteria as opposed to price? Yeah, a lot of that's going to depend upon the industry to which, you know, the clients that we did the study in participate in, whether it be a healthcare, uh, you're selling medical equipment into a hospital or whether you're working for a manufacturer and you're selling into, say, a shipping and receiving department. Uh, a lot of the criteria is going to be specific to the client that you're selling to. But I think what's really kind of important here is that we have to understand that that criteria is going to be unique to the individuals that we're talking to inside that account. Let's just take one particular case study that is in our, is in our book and that's been kind of published out here. I'll leave the company name out of it. But let's take a look at it, an organization that was selling software um, into an organization. It was a manufacturing organization. And they were here, they were talking to somebody on the cybersecurity space. And we were asking them, you know, they said, why did you lose the deal? And they said, we lost this opportunity because they went with a lower cost competitor. When we asked the obvious question, what was the criteria other than price this customer was using to compare you against the competition? We kind of had crickets. Sales representative didn't know. But we said, well, let's just kind of break that down just a little bit. And so as we started to kind of explore what was really important to this customer, we started kind of discovering what could be some potential decision criteria. So when we did the win-loss analysis and we went back to this client, as we did in many of the research studies that we did, we kind of asked the, we asked the customer, and often maybe their greatest champion, what is the decision criteria that you were using to compare company A to company B? I mean, they may not know right off the bat, but once you start kind of giving them a definition of criteria, they'll go, oh, well, it's integration with our current systems. It's experience with, with, uh, with in, in our industry. It's going to be maybe price, but it's also going to be maybe um, ease of use or, or quickly to adopt that technology. Terrific. So if it's going to be integration and ease of use and those kinds of things, it's important for us to understand how well does the customer perceive our ability to meet that criteria over the competition. So if we take something like, integration with existing systems, how, how, what does the customer think of our ability to integrate with their existing systems? Are we better than the competition, equal to the competition, or maybe not as good? And in absence of knowing that, we ended up kind of, we end up kind of making our own excuses or making our own assumptions as to what we think is important. So it becomes really critical for us to understand that decision criteria based upon the individuals that we're talking to inside that, that, that customer organization. It could be any number of things there, Jonathan. Well, you know what happens when you assume that's got dangerous effects on you and me as they, as the saying goes. Right. So, uh, but unfortunately a lot of times assumptions are all we have. Um, and I, I, you know, a lot of times I think the sales professional, uh, may not feel like they really have eyes on what those issues are. What advice do you give? Uh, to that individual. She, she's got a good contact, but she's not sure she's got enough information to pitch based on the real criteria. How, how can she uh, make it her next move? I think you're bringing up a real issue. I think that many salespeople 
you know, make the assumption and, and it's okay to start with assumptions, but you have to validate those assumptions. But let's just start off with, are we talking to the right people? You know, some of the advice that we encourage our clients to begin thinking about is if you have an individual that you're engaged with, don't assume that that person is the only person, or maybe even if they were engaged with you in the past, that they're the same person that's going to be most important or influential in this second decision. It's always good to ask, other than yourself, Jonathan, who else is going to be involved in making this decision? You know, and it's okay to ask who else is involved, you know, and for you to kind of put out a couple of names. If you're selling with inside a hospital system, you know, is the risk manager or the chief nursing officer going to be involved here as well as materials management or supply chain? No, they're not going to be involved here. Well, other than supply chain, who else might be involved? Well, we're probably going to have the chief of the emergency department is going to be involved. Terrific. Anybody else? And for it's important for us to kind of plan that out. And once we kind of start figuring out who's going to be involved, ask your greatest champion. If you had to rank these people in terms of having the strongest level of influence, the loudest voice, compared to those to whom are just going to kind of go with whatever the decision committee makes, how would you rank that? They go, oh, you know what? Supply chain doesn't have as much say in this decision as we think. What it's going to be, it's going to be the chief of the department, followed by the risk manager, followed by the director, followed by supply chain. Ah, good to know. And guess what? Now we're no longer making an assumption. We now have some validated evidence. But now it's important for us to go to that highest level person. Let's just say again, that's the chief of the department and ask them, other than yourself, who else do you think is going to be involved here? Hmm. Now think about that. How often do salespeople validate with what something they already know with somebody else, or do they simply right. just take the word for the champion and say, ah, I got this validated from the director. So it's gotta be right. Mm -hmm. So, well, you mentioned about the chief of the department. I mean, if I'm t selling a technology solution, I'm going to think CIO, CTO, and you think yeah. of that, well, it's a C level position. I mean, if I, if I'm talking to that individual that I'm selling from, from the top down, that's a good place to be, but it, it's often more complicated than that. And still egos are involved. What recommendations do you give when it's not always easy to discern what is the true decision-making chain inside your prospect company? Yeah, I think that uh, you can quickly vet that out when you start exploring these questions such as kind of why now? If an organization is willing to want to make a change, what's driving that change? Does the individuals to whom you're speaking to have awareness and confidence as to the reasons why this or their company is wanting to make a change from status quo, look at some new technologies, shift to a, shift to a new technology, shift from what they're currently doing today? If they don't have an understanding as to why now, and they can't give you the quantitative output as a result of making this investment or making this change, they probably don't have as much influence in this decision as you might think. So it's always kind of important for us to make sure that we vet out the individuals that we're talking to, to truly kind of find out whether or not they have the juice to kind of make it happen. And we never want to insult those people because you said it yourself. The CTO, the CIO also has an ego. And so we never want to go ahead and simply say, I, I recognize that you don't know, I have a clue what's going on. So let me go talk to somebody who does. Right. So it may be kind of important for us to simply ask them the question. You know, one of the things that we need to know is what are the three or four critical business metrics that you're hoping to achieve as a result of this change? And if they don't know, ask them who else might have an opinion on this as a way to maybe find out who really is involved in the decision. Yeah, right on. So this also brings up the question of sales enablement. That's actually what your firm specializes in. I mean, when it comes to the supporting materials that uh, most professionals are handed, it's going to have, you know, typically to do with the features and benefits. There may be some market comparison, especially if it's a product led play. Um, but I don't know that I see a whole lot of organizations really putting together supporting documentation or videos or presentations that could help come at some of these angles you're talking about. What, what are your thoughts on that? Do you agree? And how, how do we fix that? Yeah, I think technology is really starting to drive that. You don't see that gap or that um, inability to have 
content for, for the salespeople as often as you did maybe five, seven years ago. Sales enablement platforms, and you name them, I mean, some of the ones that we're connected to are like our high spot. But there's several other LMS systems, CMS systems that are out there. And uh, I think any time that, you know, you can partner with somebody like that to upload content and to stream content to your sales organization in a just-in-time um, manner only kind of accelerates what we call a kind of a ramp to revenue or ramp to quota because you're giving them the tools and the knowledge and the processes uh, that they need in order to succeed on the job in real time. So I do agree with you that uh, top organizations today are finding ways to make content available to their sales organization in real time. It's not just a deployment mechanism for how do you train salespeople. That's kind of yesterday's news. Everybody is now deploying training through some kind of a technology platform. But it's really about what happens after that training. Are, what kind of tools and what kind of processes and systems do you have in place to support the field organization when they are out there getting ready to make a sales call to that CTO and they really need um, some support in some manner. That's where these this types of technology sales enablement platforms really become helpful. Yeah, the deployment has definitely uh, grown by leaps and bounds. Where I'm seeing a gap frequently is that there's not enough, at least I don't think there's enough um, of an ownership. Maybe, maybe this is a, a part of the issue as we talk this out. You know, who has ownership over saying, hey, these are our three main competitors in the marketplace, and I need to know exactly how we stand up and against them. That's where I'm not seeing as much detailed information. There might be a PDF that's thrown together, but it doesn't seem like this gets enough focus. And that can be very powerful, especially in your in your technology and B2B services space where it's become pretty crowded. So you really need to know how, you, how to stand uh, up against competition more than ever today. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no doubt about that, Jonathan. I think that um, it kind of comes down to who owns that content. You know, it's, 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 it's often, you know, sad that when we are working with sales teams and we have somebody from marketing involved, and one of the questions that we ask is, we ask marketing, you know, what kind of studies, what kind of content have you put out there that you feel is being under leveraged by the sales organization? And they start listing us all this content that's not being leveraged. And then we ask the question, at what point in time in the sales process, early, middle, and late, should these particular content pieces, these tools, these job aids that you provided, when should they be used? And often they don't know. And that's a responsibility of both sales enablement professionals, vice presidents of sales, sales leaders, and marketing leaders to come together to kind of understand and agree upon when should some of this content best be used and direct the sales organization to the resources that are available. If they're trying to move an opportunity from stage two to stage three in their sales pipeline process, what tools do you recommend for them to use? Make sure they're available. Remind them that they're available for them. But that is a responsibility of sales enablement to train what's available when, marketing to make sure the content is available, and sales leadership to hold them accountable for using it. Okay, so then, and circling back to price as this uh, roadblock, speed bump, wall, depends, uh, for many salespeople, um, I, maybe we could go a little deeper on this. Uh, I, I see, again, on the prospective buyer side, there are assumptions being made. What, let's go deeper on the sales side of that. I mean, we, we may have, uh, for example, in a larger organization where you're dealing with someone that they have a little bit of budget, you're talking to them. And they're telling you, we have to go through this process. And you feel like you're kind of at the mercy. Um, maybe sometimes that's true. How do you tell the difference? And what could you do to maybe still drive results? Maybe get into that conversation with, you know, maybe a CTO that doesn't really want to have a conversation with anybody in sales. Jonathan, are you painting a picture of maybe a scenario that where is more of a bid process and that you're coming in a little bit later? Or are you talking about maybe a non-bid process, but they're simply saying, hey, we need to go explore a couple of partners here. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Either one. So, yeah. so let me try to answer your question then. I think that the way that I would look at this is the way to the best kind of get in, involved in that type of scenario to say, you know, what is the criteria? What matters? What matters most here? 
is to first of all understand what are the drivers driving this particular change. You know, Jonathan, too often we we ask in our postmortems, what was driving this customer's sense of urgency? And there was one that we did not too long ago where I asked the account manager, you know, what was driving this customer's sense of urgency? And they said they had money to spend by the end of the year, so they wanted to act now. And they end up losing the sale and I end up talking to their strongest champion inside the account. I asked the exact same question. I said, what was driving your sense of urgency to act now? And they simply just said that a new competitor hit the market for them. And if they don't make a change, their margins are going to continue to be eroded. So we have to pivot. Wow. Hmm. So the sale, the account manager didn't even understand what was driving this particular customer's desire to make a change from what they're currently doing today. And in absence of having that information, it's hard for us to align the unique capabilities to how we can help improve margins for this organization. If I'm mm-hmm. selling a technology that can potentially help drive increased margins. And so it's important for us not just to understand the criteria that they're going to use to make a smart decision. And I'll talk about that and how do we do that kind of in a bid process in just a minute. But it, it's important for us to, first of all, understand what are the drivers behind this change? Because I believe that top performers today do an excellent job of aligning their unique capabilities, those things that only they can do, to those metrics or outcomes that their clients are trying to reach. Let's face it. When's the last time you bought something that that was maybe a little bit more than what you wanted to spend for it, but it there wasn't a direct alignment between the outcomes you're trying to achieve. If you're going to try to sell a higher margin solution, a higher margin product, you better be able to quantify the value of what that's going to mean to the business metrics that your client's trying to achieve. And when you can do that, you can start to shape the decision criteria. One of the things that Ignite Selling brings to the table is the fact that when we do training, we don't use PowerPoint. We use you know, interactive learning maps and simulations. So guess what my team does? When they're out there selling, one of the things they explore is kind of what are the outcomes you're trying to drive? And the client may say, what we're trying to do is get our teams to work better together to team sell, to create better value for the customer, making something up. Well, terrific. If that is what the customer is trying to do, then us talking about our capabilities of using simulations to bring teams together creates a criteria that only maybe Ignite Selling can fulfill. So therefore, by finding out what are the critical business metrics the client's trying to achieve, aligning our capabilities to that, and then shaping that decision criteria. So it becomes really important that we begin to leverage those unique capabilities that only our company can bring to the table. But those unique capabilities have to have value. The only way you know if they have value is if you understand what is the customer trying to achieve as a result of making the change from what they're currently doing today. That answer your question? Yeah, that's good stuff. It sounds like there's sort of a dance required where you you obviously you need to be more attuned to your market, but sometimes you have something the market doesn't know would be of value to them. So you have to educate them. And uh, one of my mentors years ago, Chad Holmes, said that you can set the buying criteria, that your effective education-based marketing, that's one of your key goals, what it ought to be, to help set teaching your buyer how to buy. And you can even, you know, even offering that as a service in the marketplace. That's a value. And by distracting from, not distracting from, but by offering value outside of, better put, the, the mere transactional you know, focus of most of our communications, offering real value, really teaching you. Here's how you know the solution works for you. Sounds like a really, th- this is a message not just for sales, but for our, uh, our marketing department in terms of their, their uh, outreach content. Um, what, what are your thoughts on setting the buy, buying criteria? Uh, obviously, you can enter our content. How can the salesperson most effectively do that since many times their communications are predicated on that transactional goal? How do you kind of shift that energy and set the tone for that kind of interaction? Yeah, I think that if you, if you look at it, most salespeople, most top performers will, will often find out what is the buying criteria that you're using to make this decision. The customer is going to give them what that criteria is. They need to be asking themselves, are the unique capabilities of my organization 
included in that list of important decision criteria? If it's not, why not? And then the second question is, is how do I get it added to that? So for example, if one of the unique capabilities that we bring to the table is seamless integration with, without any hiccups, and nobody else does the kind of integration that we do, and integration is not part of that decision criteria, first of all, why not? Second of all, is how do you make it part of the criteria? And the third thing is, is how do you make it one of the top criteria? So the criteria may be established for most customers to some degree. They might have two or three decision or four decision criteria down there. But if your unique capabilities, those things that only you do and you do darn well, aren't included, how do you get that included? And then how do you raise its importance? And that's what kind of Ignite Selling teaches is how do you actually do just that? Because too often we play by the rules of our competitor or we play by the rules of the customer. Customer's given us this criteria. Where did this criteria come from? Maybe it came from the competitor. And you sometimes know that. If you look at the criteria and you see something in there that is specific to a, a competitor, you know they were involved. That doesn't mean that you can't come to play. That just simply means you either need to remove that criteria or reduce that criteria down to the bottom if you don't do it well and insert the criteria that should really matter to this customer, which are those unique capabilities that you bring to the table. Yeah. One thing that may be able to give you an advantage is if the uh, your competitor is touting something that isn't really as big a deal. Like uh, years ago, a coffee used to call themselves Mountain Grown. I got news for you. All coffee is Mountain Grown. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a real good example. So could you give us a, a quick minute, and I, and I want to give the listener a chance to go deeper with you, but just prior to that, could you give us about one and a half minutes or so of nuts and bolts? What would you tell uh, a sales leader, a sales manager, or just an individual producer? Uh, what are some next steps to up their game on this front? Maybe they realize they're missing it on selling. Is a lot of it just uh, touting more value? Grant Cardone calls uh, uh, you know price a myth. May, do you agree with that statement? Maybe that's something to riff off of. Maybe that, you know, back to fundamental selling. That could be a big part of the missing missing the mark on this too. Would you agree? I kind of agree with Grant Grant's co comment there. I think that if you define myth as something that is overstated or overbelieved to be true, then yes, I think that price is in fact a myth hmm. because I think we put too much onus on price. Again, go back to the fundamental question. Other than price, what's the decision criteria that you're using to compare us against the competition? We know price is going to be a factor, but other than price, what else? And you may, you may find yourself, as our research exposed, that price only fell into the top three 22% of the time. So if it, what's the other criteria if it's not price? Well, I can promise you this, if you don't know, you're probably going to end up losing the sale. And then when your manager comes back and says, why did you lose? You're going to say, I lost because of price. And that really isn't the factor. But I think just uh, to kind of close on this particular topic, I think things that, some things that managers can do immediately is to begin challenging the assumptions or the critical thinking of their sales organization, their sales reps. If you're my manager, Jonathan, and I tell you that, hey, I wanna to talk to you about this opportunity that I have going on with, you know, uh, you know, I'm trying to come think of a company here in Austin, Texas, where I am, say I'm trying to sell into Dell Corporation. And I tell you that, hey, I'm going into Dell and we have this new, new capability and I think that can be really useful for their people. And you don't challenge my thinking around What's driving the urgency? What metrics are they trying to improve as a result of this change? You're not challenging my assumptions around who's really involved and what and in what order and who loves you and who doesn't. Hmm. You're not challenging my thinking around the decision criteria, whether I know it or I don't know it. And you just look at those four things. If, in fact, I don't know what's driving urgency, I don't know what business metrics are trying to approve, I really don't know, I think I know who's, in, who's involved, but I haven't validated it. I don't know the decision criteria. All those things are potential assumptions that salespeople make that sales leaders need to be challenging the thinking around. But unfortunately, managers too often would go into a scenario like that and say, so Jonathan, 
got a question for you. Who's involved in the decision-making process here? You would reply back, it's Bob, Mike, Susan, and Larry. Hmm. Terrific. Manager then moves on. Nice job, Jonathan. I really think you did a good job there. I want to now ask you a little bit about some of the business metrics that are going on. What are some of the metrics they're trying to improve? Oh, what they're trying to do is blah, 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 blah. And you know, you go, nice job, Jonathan. The challenge is the fact that we are taking the sales representative at their word without challenging their critical thinking. Mm. If I'm asking you the question, who's involved? You give me four names. I might have to think about asking you a follow-up question that simply says, what makes you believe that those are the four people involved? Mm. What's been said or done? Or asking you the question, if you had to rank those people, who has the highest level of influence of the four of those? How do you know that to be true? Which of those people do you think better support our competition? And what are we doing to try to win them over? Hmm. But unfortunately, managers take that very first question, who's involved? They get the answer. They pat the rep on the back and then they move on to another topic. And that's hmm. a real missed opportunity. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of missed opportunities, I want the listener to not miss the opportunity to go deeper with you. You have a lot of great content on your website, which of course is igniteselling.com. And uh, you've also got a pretty awesome book that you co-wrote with the co-founder of your firm as well. Do you want to give us a couple words on that real quick, Steve? Yeah, uh, my business partner, Kevin Jones, and I uh, published our second book uh, last June, and it's taken off. It's done exceptionally well. Uh, end up being an Amazon bestseller uh, for the month of June of last year by hitting uh, number four on the bestseller list of all books in 2022. I'm not nice. sure where it stands right now. There's so many other business books, but we're very proud of this book. This book is a uh, cumul accumulation of our research that we had done in and around these particular topics we're talking about today. What's mm. driving urgency? What are the quantifiable metrics? How do you manage key influencers? What's the decision criteria? All of those kinds of things. And some of our our research from from uh, from all of our clients' win loss analysis is now found in this book. So we hope you hope you enjoy it. I love it. There's a little error on the graphic I just caught. This has 4.7 stars, but in point of fact, if you go to Amazon, uh, you're going to see that this book has a 4.9 star <laughs> rating. So that's about as good as it gets, and that's not like three ratings either. It's got many dozens of ratings. So it looks like it's a great book. I. I'm going to be picking up a copy. It looks like it's free if you're a Kindler or an audio kind of guy, or you can go pick it up for not too much money and it'll probably be worth thousands of times the value. Go grab the book and go check out the website, igniteselling.com. Uh, Steve, it's been a really great conversation. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. Thanks so much for jumping on the show today, adding value to our audience the way that you did today. Appreciate you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'll go one step further than anybody who's on this podcast or I mean listening either live or, or after the fact, if they want to hit me up on LinkedIn and just re mention this podcast and uh, I'll send, I'll mail them a book to them uh, directly. They'll, they'll, I'll send them a book. Rock and roll. Love that. Now there's an offer. So super. Uh, don't tell too many of your friends. We don't want to be un unkind to, uh, to our gracious uh, guest today. Well, Steve, once again, thanks for being here and hope to have you back soon. Enjoy your weekend. And uh, for everyone being here on the show today, we want to thank you as well. You make the show a great success. Uh, next week will be our final broadcast for the summer. Bring your friends. Uh, same time, same station with a fresh new topic. Uh, we'll see you then. Thanks for being here, everybody. Hey.